Okay, uh, again, like Carolyn was saying, my name's Neil Ferry. This is John Gilbert. No, John Anderson. <laughs> John Anderson, uh, we both work for uh, the Kiwi Company. And I guess uh, to start with, we're going to cover a lot of different things today. And we want to kind of let you all know that we want you to keep an open mind and think about a lot of, maybe a lot of different things that you've thought about in the past. Uh, to begin with, how many people in here have heard of Kiwi? A little bit different score than last time. Yeah. Nobody. How many people in here have heard of Gilbert? Gilbert, what do you know about him? I just heard him talk about it. Well, I heard of Gilbert Kiwi at the same time about two months ago. Yeah. Uh, you might want to hit the slide projector there, turn the light on the back of it there. I want to run you through some slides and tell you a little bit about what our company does and, and, and get you thinking about it a little bit, but uh, Kiwit is a construction company, mining company, and basically a financial company that's been in business now since 1884. The core business of the company has been, over the years, to be in the construction business. Currently today, you'll find that Kiwit operates basically under two different entities. The Keywood companies, which are typically union companies, and the Gilbert companies, which are typically merit shop or open shop or non-union operations. And looking at that, you know, what we do is we operate throughout the United States and Canada. We do some foreign work, but predominantly all of our work is in, is in North America. And if you look at this map right here, wherever you see a, a dot, uh, you can see where one of our offices are at. Our corporate office is in Omaha, Nebraska. That's where the corporation headquarters are at. I live in Omaha. I work in the corporate office. I, I work in the equipment department there. What we do in, in Omaha is we get involved in equipment issues, uh, buying equipment, selling it, uh, maintenance programs, problems with the business, personnel, hiring people, uh, firing people, uh, changing things around training, a lot of different things. John works for the Gilbert Company in Dallas, and you might describe to him what, what goes on, why you're in Dallas, and why I'm in Omaha, and how that all works. Well, we're centralized locations so we can control the work environment in that area and bid opportunities. The district office for this area used to be in Oklahoma City, and because the work kind of moved south, we relocated the district office to Dallas. We still have an area office in Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma City is Gilbert Central, Texas is Gilbert, Texas, all run out under one operation. Yeah. John, John's basic operation is, is to manage the maintenance, much the same as I do in the, in the corporate office. His is to manage it primarily in the Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas areas. So anything to do with taking care of equipment in those areas, John is our number one guy and he gets involved in it. Everybody understand that? Again, the company is, is very diversified. We work all over the United States and Canada. Wherever you see a dot, we basically have a district office. And the idea behind our districts is, is we decentralize and we look and bid work in a very typical market or a geographically defined market of that area. Now, moving ahead and talking about some other things, we're also involved in the mining business. Now, when we talk about mining, we're talking about uh, basically Coal mining, gold mining, uh, rock for uh, quarrying operations for rock for railroad ballast or for concrete products or ready mix or, or those types of things. And we work primarily in the Wyoming area, uh, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Tucson, Phoenix. Uh, we have a coal mine in Texas, does lignite mining, uh, it's a joint venture with Phillips Petroleum. We have some lightweight aggregate quarries in in uh, Southern California and Northern uh, New Mexico. In those operations, we, uh, we mine light red aggregates. It's red and colored rock for ground cover. Pretty stuff for decoration around your house. Up in Montana and Wyoming, we do coal operations and also railroad ballast operations. Again, our corporate operation for that mining group is in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, that's kind of what the company's all about. We're a, we're a big company. We do a lot of different things. I had mentioned earlier we're in the financial business. We have investments in a lot of other companies. Um, 
We own a portion of the Old Continental Can Company, which made beer cans, pop cans, things like that. We also are involved in fiber optic services. We put in fiber optic cable, familiar with fiber optic cables. We do that. We, uh, we have a network of uh, fiber optic systems throughout the United States. Right now, we're involved in, in putting fiber optic cable in England for the cable TV business. We're putting fiber optic cable underground. So again, you know, you, you look at it, we do a lot of different things. Now back to the Keywood construction operation, or Keywood and Gilbert as, as a group. Uh, we're in a lot of different businesses, or a lot of different markets. We're in transportation business, the highway program. We're in buildings, we're in power, uh, basically power plants, whether in the old days nuclear to the day, which might be cogeneration. Uh, we're in the water resources business, which is basically canals and dams, pipelines, things that that matter. Environmental business, that's where your water treatment plant, sewage treatment, uh, water purification plants, things of that nature. We also are in the industrial business, gas, pipelines, uh, all those type of related businesses. And again, we're in the mining development business where we actually go out and mine or develop mines for other companies so they can mine a product. Now, I'm talking about all those, give you an idea of some of the things we do or have done. You know, I mentioned buildings that are really going, I don't know if this can, will this show up on the camera fine? Mm -hmm. uh, for the benefit of you guys, can I shut the light off for a minute? Yeah, uh, here, here's a job we did here a while back. This is in, in Hawaii. It's called the Hawaiian Prince Hotel. And, uh, you know, guys, what we're talking about is we built this place. Basically, we had a mountainside. We went in there with... Uh, heavy equipment and we did a bunch of grading and we built this hotel on a, on a big rock uh, wall in uh, the north coast of uh, Kona, the, one of the islands in Hawaii. This particular job right here was about $140 million. Pretty big job. Now another type of job that we do is here's an uh, office building we built in Omaha, Nebraska and this we built for the uh, telephone company AT&T and what this is is uh, a building that houses all our computer systems for cost control. And uh, this particular job was something like $100 million. So we do a lot of building work. Now, converse to all that, we do a lot of other types of projects. One of them is, is uh, this job right here is in Missoula, Montana. And what we're doing here is we're, we're boring a tunnel nine miles into this mountain, 21 foot diameter tunnel, when we get down to the bottom of that tunnel, we're going to mine a cavity of gold ore. And essentially what we're doing there is we're driving a tunnel, we're building a tunnel so you can go back there and get the gold out of it. Now, you compare this project right here to, let's say this one here, completely different workplace, isn't it? Very much different than the other. This job right here, almost all the work that you do as an employee of the company there, you're underground, aren't you? Very little of the work is on the outside. On the outside of this particular thing, we got a spoil pile. Over here, we got a light maintenance shop where our mechanics work, kind of a equipment storage area, and then we got a conveyor belt that runs all the way down the tunnel to wherever we're mining and uh, loading rock onto the belt. Uh, another type of job that we do, this one right here, is mine development job. This was done in the Winnemucca, Nevada area, and here what we're doing. Is, is we're mining or developing a mine for a gold property for the Santa Fe Railroad. On this particular job right here, we moved 48 million yards of dirt. Now, 48 million yards of dirt mean anything to you? It's a lot of dirt, you know. 48 million anything is a lot. I mean, 48 million dollars is a lot. But I guess the thing is, 48 million yards of dirt is a lot of money, or a lot of dirt, or a lot of money to move it in. It's a pretty sizable project. On this job, we had about a hundred pieces of Caterpillar equipment. All the way from a 992 to a D11 to triple seven trucks with belly dump trailers, 16 motor graders uh, and the like. Just a lot of different pieces of uh, equipment. <coughs> On those type of projects right there, you know, it's going to require a lot of maintenance, isn't it? A lot of people to work on the equipment because predominantly those types of jobs where you have that much equipment requires some type of a repair or maintenance operation so that you can build the work. Whereas on a building job, you might not have as much equipment, huh? 
what it all gets down to is these different jobs and different types of uh, work. Now here's, here's something else that gets very diverse. In the Corpus Christi area of South Texas, we, we run an operation that builds offshore platforms for the oil industry. And what we're doing here is, and that what this is, is a photograph of a platform that was built called Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle was built for Shell Petroleum, and what we did was essentially build this, this uh, platform laying on its side on the ground, loaded it onto barges as you can see here, pulled it out into the ocean, unloaded the thing off the barge and then set it upright in the ocean floor so they could set a platform or a drilling works on top of it, drill down through it, and uh, drill for oil, or, or uh, I should say pump oil out of the ocean floor. Very different project, huh? Anybody in here have been to Corpus Christi? This is the Hershey Hotel, if you remember that, right downtown. And, you know, this is uh, basically a 10-story building. Take a look at this thing over here. What do you think of it? It's huge. This thing's like 1,500 foot long, 640 feet high. And we basically built the thing on the site. Different kind of job again to do something like that versus something like this, isn't it? This job right here, you've got a lot of dirt moving equipment. On a job like this, what kind of equipment would you have? Puddles, parties. Yeah, but most of this cranes, there you go. And how do you how do you hook all that steel together? Welding machines, huh? What did we say? How many tons of welding rod was in that thing? 14,000 tons. 14,000 tons is approximately, in such a matter, a welding rod of wire. It's okay. a lot of wire. There's something like 640, 630,000 tons of steel in this thing. It's a major accomplishment, and, I, and we're, we're kind of proud of it. You know, uh, there's more to the story, but essentially, you know, the contracting business, you've got a lot of different, you get involved in a lot of different projects. You see a lot of different things. And this was a different one. This is the largest oil platform in the world of its nature. We, we built it. Uh, you know, changing the talk a little bit different. Here's a job down in Florida, uh, a place called Lake Har Harbor. And what this is is a lock. It's a concrete structure job where we're going in doing some modifications to a lock on Lake Okapochi, I believe is how you say it. Did I say that right this time? I don't have any oh, yeah. job. Say it again. Like Okeechobee. Yeah, you got her. I, I, you got the right dialect. I'm from Nebraska, and I can't those words. I have doubt everyone knows. Yeah, I, I have a. Or my wife asked me last night, where am I going? You know, and I said Oklahoma. I don't know, old bogey. You know, I had a hard time. But anyhow, uh, only thing, you know, I'm from Nebraska. Only thing I know about going to Nebraska is how to play football. But other than that. Uh, <laughs> But uh, very different job. This is this job right here is small, eleven million dollar job. You know, a job like this one over here, you're talking about a hundred and ninety million dollar job. Over here, you're talking about a sixty million dollar job. You know, all these are, are relatively different sizes. This one right here is eleven million bucks. Small job, huh? Here's another job we did up in Seattle. Uh, in these are just a few of the jobs that we've done that I thought would be of interest to you. This is a little water treatment plant. This job right here was like six, six to eight million dollars, very small. On a job like that, you don't have a lot of equipment. You have some, but uh, overall, it's it's a different type of a job. And uh, you can see up here, you got Imhoff tanks and settling ponds and a treatment plant down here where you make water and send it on down to the city of Seattle. Boy, that. Uh, corn dog was superb. Wasn't it? <laughs> Here, here's another uh, another different job. This is a job called the Cheyenne Water Line, and you remember what the numbers were on it, John? Just a limb, 59 miles. Wasn't it? It's 59 miles of a water line, and essentially we ran water from Laramie to Cheyenne through a water line, and this is something like uh, 48 or 54. And I think it varied in sizes of steel pipe that had to be welded in. And, and put down this, this pipeline. We physically dug a trench all the way. And uh, in this case right here, 
we're using a tool, it's called a Henry pipe layer, and what it does is it's got tracks on both sides of it, it straddles a trench when you dig it, and it basically picks up pipe and puts it in position so you can weld it in place. Then it also has a little deal on it that you can load uh, rock in it for bedding material, we call it, and that is conveyed across and dropped down the hole so you can bed rock around the, the, the pipe for backfill material. Different kind of machinery right now. And I guess when you start looking at all this work here, you can see we've got a lot of different types of machinery on our work. And again, now here, you know, you're talking about uh, another another job. This is a job in the Calgary at the airport, Calgary, Alberta. And it's a night paving job where we actually went out to the highway, or the airport, I should say, and we laid asphalt all night long and, and lengthened and modified the runways. And uh, again, this is asphalt paving. We're also involved in a lot of concrete paving. You might tell them about what you're doing in Dallas right now. Dallas Airport's got a lot of concrete paving on it at DFW. Uh, we have two jobs currently underway. Uh, there's about 200,000 square yards of concrete being laid 17 inches thick. Some of it's 37 feet wide, steel reinforced for, for the big planes. There's lots of concrete work around. Uh, we also have a lot of highway paving work and, and the whatnot. Now, you know, in relation, here's another, uh, this is a, uh, a tunnel project that was in the Seattle area. It's another different type of job. Short transportation tunnel, got a highway in it. Here we did the tunnel, the highway, and on this end of the tunnel we did a vent building. And what that also is, what that is, is it's a building that's got a fan in it for sucking all the smoke and dust out of the, the tunnel so when you drive through it you can breathe and see and so forth and it cleans up the air and the whole works as it gets rid of the dust in the tunnel. So it's, a, again, a very different job uh, than a lot of these other things. And I guess, you know, we were just talking for a minute. If, if I had to tell you something, you can turn the lights on. If I had to tell you something about the construction business, I would tell you that, you know, guys, it's probably different than a lot of businesses that you think about. Uh, I understand some people from John Deere were in here earlier this week, right? And did you all of you see them or not? Some of you did. They, uh, John Deere, what do they do for business? They build machinery, right? They build uh, tractors and scrapers and things like that. And uh, for the most part, they got plants that they build all this stuff in, huh? And they build a product and they engineer and design it and so forth. Ryder was in here, huh? What, what's Ryder do? Police trucks, right? They, they got a continual business or a service organization. They basically lease trucks, have shops that take care of them. Pretty much the same business day in, day out. Uh, Hal Burton was in here, is that true? Or, and, and Slumber J, oil field related businesses, somewhat different, but basically the, the, the focus of that business is in one particular area, the oil patch. The thing that I, I, I think is that you hope you can appreciate about what we're talking about here today is, is everything we do as a construction company is different than the last job. Nowhere in our business do we do the same thing really twice. No two highways are the same. They're not in the same place. Typically you don't always have the same people working on them. You've got different ground conditions, different weather. Uh, different state agencies you're working with, and because of all that, our business is really kind of inefficient. And although it's somewhat efficient, you know, we think it's very rewarding. We think it's something that's, that's from a uh, personal basis, there's a lot of satisfaction. And you, you get a lot of, you feel good about your job because, you know, it's not like making hamburgers. When you make hamburgers, you make hamburgers all day long, don't you? You don't take long to figure that out. You know, three or four hours, you got it, don't you? Well, maybe not you, but you know, some of you know, get down to this. Huh? Still working on the hamburgers, huh? Yeah. But anyhow, it gets down to, you know, the construction business is completely different than, than a lot of things. It's very different, very diversified. And, right, you got a comment or two on that? I think Kevin said the slight difference between working in the shop and in the field. What do you mean? Well, you work in a shop, you look at the same four walls, you look at the same transmissions in and out, maybe the same engines. You're in the field, you're looking at something different every day. It's a hydraulic problem. Or something that always changes the conditions you're working in. 
no monotony in the field. That's a good point. And you start talking about that. Working in the field from a personal standpoint in maintenance, and, and we're both in maintenance. I've worked for Kiwit now 22, 23 years. How long do you work? You work for Kiwit 17 years. Um, all of, all of my whole career, I've been involved in equipment, doing something with it. Same you way. you the same way. And we think that the neat thing about construction is, is that you can see a lot of different kinds of work, and you can work a lot of different places. And your job, your life has color. It's not as it's not boring. It's very exciting. If, if you're going to be working with equipment, it's probably one of the more exciting ones. Whereas if you're going to be working in a shop. Johnson, the same four walls every day as one. Now, talking about all that, and putting you in the set of tense of mood, you know, you start talking about all these things. You know, what kind of equipment do we have? Huh? I'll just go through a few things that we've got. Pickups, cars and pickups, you know. We've got uh, basically 1,400 pickups in our company. We have 300 cars that are used for transportation for the most part. Uh, this one right here, we got in quite a discussion with the morning group. This one right here happens to be one of the finer pickups made. Yep. It's the Ford Motor Company pickup. We have uh, 1,100 of these and 300 of the other brand. You know? I've seen a lot of The other stuff, you know, that the one that we don't talk about, the C word. But anyhow, uh, uh, you know, when you start talking about Maintenance, like we're talking about here today, and, and we're talking to you about maintenance from a contract. <coughs> Some of the, the maintenance on our job is keeping these things running. Pretty minor, pretty simple maintenance. It's not that difficult. In some cases, on some of our jobs, we refuse to work on pickups. We don't think it's, a, it's valuable time for our employees on a project to work on a pickup. We think we've, they've got better things to do than waste your time working on pickup. We'll talk about some of those in a little bit, what, what's important. We also have a lot of trucks. Uh, the company has uh, roughly, roughly 2,100 trucks, ranging from a highway tractor to a dump truck to a concrete pump truck to a uh, drill truck to a mechanics truck or loop truck. This here happens to be a, a photograph of one of our mechanics trucks, and it's one of of about 400 service type vehicles that we own. John, you, you might uh, open the door, I guess. And, uh, uh, you, you might tell them a little bit about what this thing is. Just take it down a piece, as a matter of fact. Was that? Yeah. I think that's an F700, fellas. It looks to me like it. Uh, this truck is basically built in our Sheridan shop. They, they manufacture the bed and mount the cranes. And what you're seeing is a 7,500 pound hydraulic crane on the back end. 400 amp welder which has a 25 CFM compressor on the back end of it. Uh, inside of the bins you will find tools like one inch drives, uh, impact wrenches come along, grinders, drills, all the big things to get your, your work done. You have lights for night work and torches and places to put your personal tools. Um, someone asked in the earlier class, do we give all of our mechanics out on a job one of these trucks? We'll respond to that one this week, I guess. Um, these, these trucks are basically project trucks, and normally you'll find us working double shifts, and there'll be two guys on the truck. And each guy will have his own department to lock his tools on. And, and, you know, again, I'll tell you, we own a lot of these. What do they cost? $80,000. Pretty expensive truck, huh? Now, we, our, our philosophy, Kiwit, and other contractors share the same philosophy is, is that we want to spend money we, we probably spend a lot of money on those where other people may not. Why would you spend so much for one of these things? Keep your employees happy. I keep you happy. I'll give you the $80,000. <coughs> I mean, job I may done. Job. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. impossible to get the job done quick and easy fishing. That's it. And, and what do you mean? We have the tools you need and the ability to perform the work that comes, comes up. You're exactly right, and, and what it gets down to in this business that's inefficient, this is probably an efficient way of doing repair work or maintenance, and we, our philosophy is, is gear it up right and make it so people can go out and do a job 
and do it right. And again, I'll tell you that this isn't this isn't just one of, of a few. We have a lot of trucks like this. And, and how many do you have in Texas like this? I think there's uh, 14. Yeah, there's there's a number of them around, and that's basically in the Dallas area for the most part, right? And some are a little smaller, some are a little bigger. You know, and it all kind of depends on what type of equipment we have. There. So we got a lot of different kinds of equipment. We also uh, we also own a lot of cat equipment. Uh, other than the U.S. government, our company is Caterpillar's number one customer. We buy more equipment annually from Caterpillar than anyone else in the United States except for Caterpillar. Each year we'll spend 40 to, let's say, $60 million on a good year with Caterpillar. Typically we always spend $40 million with them each year. In the case of this particular slide right here, this is a uh, shot of uh, some cat equipment working on a job in in New Mexico, uh, the job name was called Elbar, and it was a uh, uranium tailings cleanup job. And, and essentially, what's going on there is we're uh, we're uh, loading out dirt. And uh, what we have here is a Cat 768 or 769 with a 80-ton bottom dump trailer. It's being fed by a Caterpillar 988. The uh, in the background, we've got a, a Cat D10N which is a, a dozer. Uh, this machine right here, what's one of these cost today, John, remember? I think I need about $600,000, aren't they? $600,000, huh? Truck, trailer, it's worth about another $500,000. D10, $400,000, $450,000. A lot of money, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's uh, like I said, we, we spend a lot of money with them. Our whole concept behind spending money with uh, Caterpillar is and buying and running new machinery is, is is that we believe that if we run newer machinery for the most part, we enjoy good availability, low repair cost, and excellent productivity out of our machinery. Now we're going to talk about what that all means in a few minutes, and, and from the standpoint of what maintenance is really all about. But we buy a lot of new equipment because it runs good, and we we make money with it, so that's why we do it. I think this one here's got a 3408 in it. This one over here's got a 3408. D10N, I think, has got 3412, right? Big, big engines, you know, so forth. Uh, here's another photograph of a CAT the D10L. This uh, particular machine here is 770 horsepower. Uh, as you can see, I think a D10L weighs right around 200,000 pounds. Big machine. The back has got a ripper. Uh, what, what, what do you use rippers for? Ripping rock. Yeah, ripping up the ground, ripping up rock. Uh, let's say you had a, let's say you had a, a D10 ripping dirt versus a D10 ripping rock. Which one of the two is going to require more maintenance? One ripping rock, ripping rock. Yeah, there's, there's a difference, isn't there? And, uh, you know, that, that's an issue. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, too, huh? Uh, Here's uh, another picture of, uh, of uh, Mount St. Helens upside down. But uh, as you can see, that's an uh, inverted uh, cat. I should change that one, shouldn't I? Uh, in this case right here, we've got a, a truck crane. We own a lot of cranes. We own about 600 cranes for various types of projects where we need lifting. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of jobs that uh, lifting is the main operation and there's very little dirt. This particular picture right here was a job we had in Oklahoma on a bridge that covered the Red River, or went over the Red River in uh, about 1984, 1985, where we built a bridge over the Red River, this approach side. Essentially, we have a lot of different kinds of equipment. Tower cranes, we got those, those are different. Use those typically on big structures, dam work, buildings, things like that. Uh, very different than caterpillar tractors. We also own a lot of plants. This, in this case here, got a portable asphalt plant. And this particular picture here was taken just outside Glen, uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado. But what this is is an asphalt paving plant that used for making asphalt for laying down on the highway. Uh, what did you do a job here when? Uh, it's been completed just about a year now. From, I don't know the name of the town here north towards Oklahoma, right down the edge of town. We paved, we overlaid the northbound side of the road. 
on, on 75. We had a job here last year. Last year. And essentially, we brought a plant like this in, set it up, made asphalt, laid it with lay down equipment, moved it out, and that plant right now is in Oklahoma City, I think, on working on another job. But it's a portable plant. This type of a thing here today cost a million, million and a half, excuse me, to $2 million for a portable plant. We have 21 of these running around. There's also concrete plants that are similar. Uh, I guess, you know, looking at all this different diversity, we, you, know, you see a lot of different types of equipment. And from a standpoint of you fellows, you know, you've gone to school here to learn about equipment. And although you probably have learned more about componentry than you have actual working pieces of equipment, this is a lot of diversity in the construction business. You'll see a lot of different things. This particular picture right here is a, a concrete laydown operation that's going on at the Denver Airport right now in Denver, Colorado. We're working up there. They're Denver. They're building a new airport in Denver. I don't know if you're any of you are familiar with it, huge project. It's uh, second largest construction project in the world right now. The new Denver Airport. A lot of work going on. Thousands of people working there, hurrying to get this thing done. As you can see, it's a Gamaco machine. It, it lays concrete, slip form concrete paving. It, you basically dump rough concrete out of a dump truck in front of the machine. This machine forms it, molds it together, and, and paves a smooth slab coming out of the back of the machine. Hydraulic machine, has lots of hydraulic uh, uh, requirements, uh, capabilities, and so forth to get that in a whole paving process done. A lot of different things. Uh, what, tell them about this, John. What, yeah. That's an operation that we have going on in Dallas. Uh, the truck in front is an all-wheel drive, all-terrain, articulated, global 35-ton truck. And what it's hauling is a cement treated base, we call it CPB, and it's dumping into a, a German made ABG paper. And that paper is real high density because it has a dual tamper bar screen and requires very little rolling on the back end. Essentially, uh, you got four of the Volvos? Four of the Volvos, yeah. yeah. One of the ABG. The Volvos are worth about uh, 300 Yeah, we pay a million bucks for four of them. Yeah, a million dollars for four of them. Uh, that paper is $500,000. Half a million bucks for that paper. You know, it's just a, it's an incredible the amount of money that can be spent on it. It's all kinds of stuff in construction, all kinds of equipment. Here's a, a high pressure cement blower. Here's something you see. I mean, you talk about diversity, we can show you anything from cat equipment to barges to towboats to cranes, cement blowers. Here's a high pressure uh, cement conveyor, and this is made for blowing dry cement, you know, not the wet concrete. This is the actual dry powder that you put with the rocks to mix up the dry cement powder. This thing is capable of delivering about 180 tons of dry cement an hour from a truck into a silo. It's, it's an interesting tool. It's very different. Now, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things, you know, and I guess what we want to talk about for the rest of the afternoon, <coughs> uh, and when I say the rest of the afternoon, what time do we break here? Or what time is the... 1.30. 1.30 is, is the break. Hey, what do we got, two hours or something? Two, three hours here? Three. Out by three? Three, three, three. Okay. We're, uh, you know, we're going to talk about some of the different things. This picture right here, just to tell you, is a, is a picture of one of our repair shops in Portland, Oregon. And in the company, we own a number of big repair shops for maintaining our equipment. You might want to turn the light on, John. Uh, it's, it's one of several. Here's some magazines. I don't know if any of you got all these or not. But basically, uh, this is a company magazine. It's a, uh, it's a every other month deal. And, and in it, you've got some feature stories about some of the jobs that we're doing. And you can see a lot of different things that's going on. And if you look in here, you can see we're, uh, we're building a bridge in New York City. Uh, you turn to the next section. Here's a prison we're building in the Chicago area. Uh, here's a revamping a, a acceleration ramp on the freeway in, the, in Honolulu that we're working on. Um, there's a lot of different, here's a tunnel that we're driving in the Boston Harbor cleanup project. Uh, on page 14 is, you may read about these books, is a deal in here on about, about our district shop or our refill facility that we have in uh, Sheridan, Wyoming. And if you look at that, that's a, a basic uh, 
story about some of the things we build and repair on our shop there in Sheridan, uh, Wyoming, and it's it's pretty interesting for you guys if you're uh, looking at what our capabilities are. Uh, in the back of the book, you've got uh, some, a listing of all the jobs we got and what the jobs are, and it's, it's pretty interesting reading. In the very back, it shows you where all of our district offices are and so forth. Now, that's a pretty good warm-up on, on what we do, and, and I guess to, to tell you in a nutshell, we do a lot of different things. And, and we're not here today to talk to you about going to work for our company. We're here to talk to you about what maintenance is all about from a contractor's viewpoint, or what it's like to do maintenance on a construction job. And we, we had uh, lunch with Rick, huh? And uh, we talked about a lot of different things. And we told him a lot of things we told the morning group, and he told us a lot of things that he wanted us to tell you guys. But, uh, in, a, in a basic nutshell, I'll tell you a few things very quickly about the equipment business. Most everything you learned in this school doesn't really apply to the construction equipment business. In order for you guys to get good at construction equipment maintenance, you got to keep going to school. It may not be a siege like you've been under here for the last trimester or how long, how long you've been here? Two years. Two years. It, it might not be that long, but training is going to be something in the equipment business that you go through the rest of your life. Why is that? You got it. That's exactly right. The equipment is changing all the time. There's bigger, better, faster, quicker, more efficient machinery being built. Uh, in today's terminology, you know, electronics play such a big part of that business that uh, for me to sit here and tell you that when you graduate from this place and you go on out and work that you don't have to have to go to school again, I'd be flat lying to you. The facts are you have got to continue your education in some manner to be good at this business. And if you don't, you haven't got a chance of succeeding. You really don't. You've got to continue to teach yourself and learn things, how to do better. Now I mentioned to you that things in the equipment business, the construction, don't really apply to what you're doing here in school. And I'll tell you this, you're here in school, I believe, from what I know, to learn about how diesel engines work, right? You learn about how to put them together, how they work, probably how to overhaul them, probably some of the maintenance standpoint, some of the different things. For the most part, you're, you're here to learn about the inner workings of machinery, whether it's an engine or a transmission or whatever. When you get out on a construction job, we don't want you doing any of that kind of work. We are not interested in you working with your wrenches fixing the machine. We want people to maintain it. We want people who can make the engine or the component or the machine live and last so we don't have to overhaul it. Make sense? Why is that? <laughs> you got it. You save money in downtime. You know, and talking about a few things for a minute. Who in the hell, who in the yeah, who in the hell in here? Who, who in here knows if that if that goddamn thing wasn't on? I'd be saying a whole hell of a lot more. <laughs> I have a hard time talking, you know, just plain boy talk. I got to talk like boys really talk. But anyhow, uh, how many of you in here know what availability is? Availability. Yeah, what's the word availability mean? Define that. Plenty of it. Huh? Plenty of it. You got plenty of it. I mean, if you're looking up in the dictionary, what would it say? The ability to have. <laughs> <laughs> the access of the you know ability is uh, the ability availability means it's it's there to get right. You can get something. It's available. Availability. If we say availability is good. What's that mean? You got plenty, plenty to from. That means you can go get it right now. Availability is bad, what's that mean? Gotta wait for it. Can't get it right now. If we were talking about construction machinery and we were talking about mechanical availability, 
What's that mean to you? What's mechanical availability mean? I mean, you got enough mechanics to cover all your equipment. Yeah. But what do we mean by mechanical availability? Having the machine there when you need it. Having the machine there when you need it. And when you ever add the word mechanical to it, the right machine. that means it's capable of going to work. When you go out there and turn that key over, the thing runs. And you can run it all day, huh? That's mechanical availability. That's good mechanical availability. What's bad mechanical availability? When it's there, you can't you can jump it. Yeah. You've been at the gas stations too long. But that means that you... you it, it, you can't use it, huh? If we were to sit down and talk about availability, and we were to say that 40, let's say you work 40 hours a week, okay? And let's say that you had 100% mechanical availability. What's that mean? It means you got, all, you got paid all 40 hours that you wanted. Well, that means that you, that you scheduled to use the machine for 40 hours, and you actually did operate it 40 hours, right? And if we were saying that it was 100% availability, right, all 40 of the hours that we scheduled to run the thing, it operates, right? What if we had 50% availability? That means that you schedule to run it 40 hours, right? And you can only operate at 20 because the other 20 hours it was down. Because of that, it was only available to you for 50% of the time. Mechanical availability is 40%. Now what does that all mean in a nutshell? If you've got to go out and you've got to build a highway, and you've got 300 calendar days to build it in, do you want to have 100% availability or 50% availability? Sure, because you want to try and either build it for the 300 days or something below that, don't you? If you got 50% availability, it might cost take you 600 days. Then what happens? You pay out. I mean, the company pays. Who do you pay? Probably pay fines and penalties for. Could be. Yeah, you might pay somebody uh, a penalty for not completing on time. Who else do you pay? Well, your well, money, you spend money. Money. Yeah, your overhead, your burden, your people that are there working, huh? And, and in the case of maintenance and equipment, what what are what's our goals? We're trying to get you know the ultimate equation in construction maintenance is is high availability. Make sense? How about if you had a 40-hour job, or 40 hours of schedule, and you were getting getting uh, 30 hours a week out of it? Yeah, 75 percent. You got it. It's, you know, there's a lot of different formulas and ways to calculate availability. I don't know if you've been exposed to that here, but there's different formulas and, and from the contractor standpoint in maintenance, that's your whole goal. Get your availability up. Additional to that, you have low costs. Huh? Now, that's a 40-hour basis. That's a five days a week, eight hours a day, right? What happens if you have a job where you've got to move, let's say, uh, 150 million yards of dirt? That's a bad example. Too much dirt. There ain't no, that, that's not even realistic, is it? Pretty big. Too much. I know. <laughs> How about if you had to move 15 million yards of dirt and <coughs> you had 100 days to do it in? What would that mean? That'd mean that you'd have to move how many yards of dirt a day? About 150,000 yards. 150,000 yards a day, right? You do it 40 hours a week? Okay. Overtime, right? Well, that's five. <laughs> huh? Nine. You'd probably go to a second shift, huh? You Two. work eight hours a week? Think? Or 
120. You're saying you're going to work three shifts, shifts huh? Or six. You're, you're going to work, work three shifts. Work two, six. You've got to take the weather in consideration. Well, oh, sure you do. But when the sun shines, you make hay, don't you? In the construction business, when the sun shines, you, you move dirt. If, if I was to give you the example of 100, 150,000 yards of dirt a day, what schedule would we run? We run three shifts. Three shifts? How many days a week? Seven days a week. You work every hour possible, would you? You end up running seven times 24. You'd run 100. You'd schedule 168 hours in a week. Now, in relation to availability, what's that all mean? That I means you're going to have you're going to have some. Uh, it's going to come off a hundred, but you can't run it. Mm -hmm. you can't run yeah, you, it's, in, it's inconceivable to think you're going to get 100 percent availability in it. Absolutely, and it's going to be something less than that. But but the facts are, and, and the functions of the business are, is in order to get that type of performance out of the machinery. In order to achieve some type of availability, you've got to have some type of a maintenance operation going on to keep the machines running instead of letting them go down and not being available to run. Don't you? you know, so back to you guys and back to here at school. You know, we've learned a whole lot about repair work. How much maintenance work have you learned about? Yeah, it's, it's but there's going to be time. Yeah. Can't predict the breakdown. It's just going to happen. Sure, you're going to have sudden death failures. failures. You're going to have some goddamn thing crater on you and say, "Shit, we've maintained it all week long and all night long, and it's still broke, huh?" I mean, yeah, that's right. It's it's there. And practically, when you get down to it, on a one shift operation, our company we have goals. And our goal for one shift operation is we want to have 95 percent availability. On a two shift basis, we want to have 75, excuse me, we want to have 80, 85 percent availability. And on a three shift basis, we like to get 70 percent. Now, there's somewhat, you know, in between for six days a week and seven days a week, but for the most part we're talking about five days a week, single, double, and triple shift. And those are the things you shoot at. And, and again, recognizing the equipment does break, you, know, you can't keep it up 100% of the time when you don't have any time to work on it on an off-shift basis. When, you've got, when you're working a single shift, you can do a lot of maintenance on the off-shift, so we're working 40 hours a week and keep your availability real high, can't you? But when you start adding hours to the operation, it's harder to achieve availability. Did somebody have a question? I had one, but you just answered it. I wanted to work on a five-day five week. But they work on Saturday and Sunday, that ain't going to cut your availability percentage down when you're off time. Now, typically, availability, you know, it, it can. If you do maintenance on the weekends or have off time to do it, it can keep it up because you reduce the risk of something breaking that you know is wrong when you're trying to run it. But uh, when you're working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every damn hour counts against you, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, Thinking about all that, anybody got any questions about that? Do you trade your used equipment back in? Do you trade how many hours? How many hours you put on a piece of equipment before you trade it off? Or? It's a good question. It's almost like a recording from this morning. We we got a lot of ways of doing it. Okay, some of it's based on some of it's based on uh, historical information. Some of it's based on uh, recommendations from manufacturers. Some of it's based on market conditions. You know? So basically, it would just be part change, right? Then you go to the and change it, and it's like, no, we send this and we put it back to us. Follow you down. I, I hope that you would never be a parts changer. You know what we think about part changers? What? We think they ought to work somewhere else. We cannot afford parts changers. Why is that, John? Parts changers change components without analyzing what they're putting, why they're taking them out, why they're putting them back in, and invariably the one they put back in fails for some other reason. I mean, we know. We don't troubleshoot. Don't troubleshoot. 
Yeah, you gotta be a You know for sure you hammer an engine. And it's blunt. You go, it wasn't changing. We don't even touch the engine. We just send it off to the manufacturer and they send us another one and we put it in. That, that's, that can happen. We'll, we'll talk about more of that in a minute. We'll you, asked, you, you asked the question a little bit ago what we do with our machines. In the industry, most people monitor by hours. We run most of our machines 8,000 hours. Okay? 8,000 hours is great on some <coughs> machines, on others it isn't. <coughs> some machines you run to 16,000 hours. Some machines you run to 4,000 hours. There's a wide variance of how long you keep the machines. Sometimes you keep a machine as long as it's economically feasible to own it. Like you're saying, when you start changing not the engines all the time, there's probably a better way to go and you might want to buy a new one. Or a better one, or a different style. Or get rid of the one that's got the goddamn engine problems, huh? <laughs> right? There's a lot of different factors. A lot of times we, we get rid of machines because we run out of work. Or sometimes we got a machine that we paid, let's say, $500,000 for it. And although we can run it to 16,000 hours, at 8,000 hours we can get $375,000 for it. It might make good economic sense to sell it because the new one's only another hundred twenty-five thousand. And there's all kinds of factors, you know. Can't answer your question. Anybody in this business says they can line to you. There's one man in the company that makes that decision on an individual no, sir. basis. No, it, sir. It's 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 so big of an issue that it takes a lot of different factors, doesn't it? And it it really there's not one guy that can do it. We have guidelines and we have ways of following it, and it's basically a mathematical formula that people sign off on. But uh, we try to look at each piece of equipment individually on an annual basis, predict what its future engine requirements might be, component work might be, look at its condition, and make that decision on keeping or selling it. Something that's highly utilized, you'll be more often to replace it quicker, keep the maintenance down. Something that's lower utilized, you might hold on to and fix some of the problems that can run longer. There's not a standard, you know, if you could, somebody could define that, they'd sell a big book and make a lot of money. But, uh, uh, you said something a little bit ago about uh, being parts changers. Oh, we're in Chevrolet Garage and none. That's all we did is parts changers. It's cheaper to go buy, put down here Champs and buy $400 fall block with them. Any tack on fifteen hundred dollars plus the block, you got fifteen hundred dollars in your pocket. You know the the difference between let's say a garage and our business is is typically the people that you're working for. Yeah. You don't even have an estimate. They bring the car into you and they say it won't run. Fix it, right? and you take out all the parts that you know or you think are wrong and you replace them and you write up a bill for it and you put it in front of them when they walk up to the window and they pay for it. Right? If we did that in our business, our cost would be phenomenal. How do you get work in the construction business? You competitively bid. What's that mean? You got to be the lowest bidder to get the job. In order to have the low bid and get a lot of work, you got to have good costs, right? That means that procedurally and functionally, you got to be able to go out every day and build highways, lay concrete, do grading, maintain equipment cheaper than the best the next guy, right? The people you're bidding against oftentimes don't, don't have the best cost. How, how do you think they bid work? Extremely. How do they stay in business being high? They don't. Not too long. Okay, so then how do they bid work? Well, they under bid yourself a lot of business. Like Sometimes that. they bid costs that they've never, never gotten, right? Yeah. <laughs> they bid low to get work, and they go out of business for being too low. And our company, and like all of them, we try to figure out what our costs are, estimate those costs, submit a bid, then we go out and perform the work below those costs. 
if I've got an estimate that says the cost of running a D10 tractor is uh, $75 an hour, okay, and I got you working on the thing, and you're a parts changer, how much are you going to cost me, do you think? As much as I can take the yeah, <laughs> Probably. You know, so our business, we, we, we're not like some guy who's got a broken car. We already know how much we could, we could spend to enter estimates. We're trying to do the work cheaper and lower so we can make money as a company. We have a budget. Parts changers don't have any budget. When we see a parts changer working for us, we'll fire them. Can't afford them. They cannot make estimate on repair work. Can't have them around. All that sounds pretty confusing. Basically a simple little discussion on construction business, a few of the things that are like that out there. It's very, uh, very different. Let's take a break and we'll come back and load some irons and real pieces of equipment for that discussion. And, and uh, all we're trying to do guys is kind of give you an idea of what construction is all about. We talk about a lot of different things here. And we're, you know, some of you might think this is a real abstract conversation, but I hope at the end of all this, you can kind of put it back together and see what we're trying to do. And, and we really think a lot of what we're talking about here is different than what you're used to. So you get a little impatient, you know. Uh, here it's out. We have uh, <coughs> plenty of to do. John's passing around some of our cards. Uh, we'll talk about cards a little bit later on. You want to turn that slide projector on? Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that go on out on a, on a, a job or a construction site. This here is a this here is a photograph, a blurry photograph of a, a Cat Fit 657 scraper. And uh, as you can see, we got the engine out of the thing. Tell them about a 657, John. 657s are uh, twin engine rigs. They're push-pull units, meaning that they help each other get loaded. Normally, they work in pairs. Uh, 3412 engine in the front, 3408 in the back. One operator runs all the functions of that machine. Typically, we run four to eight of them. Either four of them as a group or eight as a group. They cost $960,000 a piece. Right? You're running uh, eight of them together. You know, you start thinking of this problem we had here when you're talking about availability. What, what's the relevance of the investment cost of machine and high availability? If you're going to cough up eight million bucks for eight of these damn things, you ought to be keeping them maintained and working so you can make some money with them, right? If you can't work, you ain't got a chance of making money with them, do you? Now, like we were saying, you know, uh, <coughs> cameras floating around on us, or we need to get the uh, automatic focus fixed in this thing. Here. Uh, this particular picture right here, we've got the engine out of a six, 657, and uh, you know, uh, this machine right here, it costs about $125 an hour to operate. Uh, when you start looking at all the components that are in there, a 3412 engine, what's the cost of overhaul of 3412? Probably $35,000. What's it cost if you uh, create a one? 50 to 60 and then break the block. Okay. So from the standpoint of working on all this stuff, again, we're, we're telling you, we're not really interested in you guys getting in there working on anything. We're, we're interested in you know, maintaining them so they keep running. This particular one here, as you can see, we've got it all torn apart. It's really a particularly clean looking operation. Somebody's taken all the parts as they pull the engine out and laid them on pallets, did a good job of plugging all the lines and stuff. Why do you do that? Yeah, eliminate the contamination problems and so forth. Uh, again, the back of the machine. And it's a clean, real clean looking operation from the standpoint of the guys working on this machine and here's the radiator everything's palleted up there and finally here's a, a photograph of the engine that's uh, that's going out now 
What would I, what would I tell you if uh, we would come to a school like this one right here and talk to you guys about going to work for us, but we never wanted you to do this work? What do you think, I'm crazier than a pet coon or something? Huh? Doesn't make much sense, huh? Hiring guys with the education that you're, you've committed yourself to and then not let you work on this kind of stuff? Why would we not want to have you work on it? You're trying to get the minor work done and the maintenance kept up before this, you won't get to this point. Yeah, in a nutshell, that's one of the big pictures. How about if I was to tell you when this thing did break down because we had an unexplained failure, uh, we had the dealer come out and we paid him $65 an hour to, to repair it. Instead of paying you guys $10 or $15 an hour or whatever the number is to work on it. What would you think if I said that's what we wanted to do? You like to spend a lot of money, you don't have no confidence in your mechanics or, or some other reason. <laughs> might be that I, by saying that, I might be saying, hey, hey, you're too busy to work on this stuff. We've got you involved in a maintenance program where you're out there fixing minor repairs and identifying problems with the machines before they're failing and fixing them instead of doing this heavy repair work. I might be saying that when I'm hiring a dealer mechanic to come out and do all this stuff, he might be better trained and qualified than you, right? He might be more efficient than you guys because maybe, just maybe, you aren't trained in this kind of stuff. Remember all this different kind of equipment's on a job? You can't be the best at everything. You're only probably going to be the best at a few things in your whole life. And you can't be the best mechanic on all types of equipment. And, and soon all of you will develop a niche that you'll fall into. Some that, you know, you say, I don't know anything about that, and I don't know anything about this. It's damn difficult for you in this age to be good at everything. In the case of this one right here, the dealer, you know, has people who do this every day, and we don't. And we probably want to have them come out and fix it, and repair it, and then what do we obtain? Warning. Probably get a warning. There you go. We also end up getting a warning, too, don't you? So ain't this a crazy deal? Here we are, we're in here talking to you about doing maintenance work. You guys are at the school, we're all about these things. And we're telling you we're not even going to let you work on this shit, huh? It's probably what we're really looking for. When you get right down to it, so much of the business today is either in the maintenance operations or in the operation of identifying problems with machines and subcontracting the work out to be repaired to someone who can warrant the work, or someone who can competitively quote on doing this thing. In this particular case right here, on this machine here, we didn't have our mechanics work on it, we didn't pay the dealer a damn thing to fix it. How did we get that done? Yeah, we used the existing warranty on the machine. It had a failure on the machine. There was warranty existing on the machine that the, the failure was covered under. We're not about going to take our mechanics who are making X dollars an hour and have them fix something when somebody else is liable for the repairs under warranty. When we buy a new machine, part of the purchase part price is got warranty in it. And we're saying that, hey, when that thing fails and it's under warranty, we want to get some of them dollars back. We don't want to spend ours again to fix it. Make sense? When you start talking about all those kinds of things, what does that mean? That means that you can go out and do maintenance work and keep your availability high. And when it comes down to doing, looking at having the lowest cost, you'll probably get lower cost on your work by having the dealer do work under warranty than you do the actual work, right? And that's all part of the big picture. You got any comments on that, John? I don't think so. Show you another picture here. This is a case 1085B. It's a what we call a cruise air. In the business, it's a hydraulic excavator. It's got a boom on it, a bucket on the end of it. 
got tires on it instead of tracks like a crawler excavator. It's got a house on it that swings 360 degrees. Use it for excavating in ditches, digging holes, and things like that. This one right here has got a thumb attachment on it. It's got a bucket and a thumb. And basically a bucket, you know, lets you dig like so with the boom. This thumb attachment lets you pick things up. Okay? Lets you pick things up. Now, putting you guys in a job situation, uh, take a look at this machine here. You know, it's got an outrigger on it. What, what do you use an outrigger for on it? On a crane or it stabilizes it, supports the machine, levels it up so you can operate it efficiently without upsetting it and so forth. On this particular one right here, what do you see? Stabilizer fell off. Stabilizer fell off, huh? Bin broke. Now, bin broke, huh? Now, we put you guys in a job situation. What do we do about this? Warning, warning. Warning, you guys pick it up right now, huh? Anybody in here want to fix that thing? Trade it in. Trade it in. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't spent enough time with you. <laughs> Obviously, you got to learn there's more in the world than Caterpillar, buddy. You know, you, you, you talk about our, we've got a lot of experience with machinery. This particular machine right here, again, like I tell you, the, the Case 1085. In the state of Oklahoma here, a number of years ago, we had some experience with Caterpillar's comparable machine like that. They call the 212, and it was horrible. It's a bad piece of equipment that Cat was built at that time. Could have changed now, we probably should try it again. But from that point on, we bought and used the case because it's a better piece of machinery. We have less problems with it. Well, back to this outrigger that's broke off. You know, uh, what do you think of that? Should we fix it or you say warranty? What's that mean? I'm go back to find that wine, though. I'm going to turn it into something. Analysis. You got a warranty. Damn time, you know, much more. I'm waiting for somebody to come out and fix it. You're saying get up busy and fix it right away. I'm huh? saying find well, out for somebody. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's, look, right? let's look at some more of this machine, huh? Here, here's the boom. And on that machine, it's got an extendable boom. And, and this boom telescopes in and out so you can move that bucket in and out. And right in here, if you look look up at this thing, what do you see? Welding rod, huh? Welding, huh? Time to trade that thing in here. It's, yeah. it's got 600 hours on it. Uh, 600 hours. What we're doing with this machine is we're reaching out and we're picking up slabs of concrete out of a median on a bridge and picking them up and loading them on a truck. Overload? Check the operator. You're saying we could be abusing it, huh? Yeah, yeah that's good thinking. Some cases, you know, you, that's a factor in the business. You do a lot of repair work because people are abusing machines. You can't afford to do this business with people who abuse machines, can you? You can't put enough money in your estimate to generate enough cash to fix a machine if somebody's tearing it up. You've got to stop abuse. In this case right here, the machine had been used in an application of dirt. In fact, this machine was here in Oklahoma, Texas. We transferred it down to, to uh, Tampa on a job down there right now, and within two shifts, all this happened. Checked all that out. Went to the load chart of the machine, checked out how big a slab we were picking up, picked up the slab, the machine broke. Looked at the lifting capacity of the machine, looked at the operation, we found out the machine wasn't capable of doing what they said it could do. They overrated their machine. <coughs> or underrated it. Sure. So, from a standpoint, you know, you get into a knee-jerk reaction. A lot of people say, well, shit, I can make that thing. So run up out there and weld it again, and I'll weld it and put plates on it and all kinds of stuff like that. We're not interested in doing that. That's expensive. Our, what, what do we normally what do we do, John? 
Well, seeing that it's down, you'd probably go in another machine and have the dealer get involved and get this thing fixed and then charge them for the running machine for your down. If that didn't work, then you better document everything before you do it by calling the dealer and telling the problems and take a bunch of pictures and do some exact write-ups and then get to the hopefully it doesn't get to that point. Hopefully you keep the lawyers out of it. Yeah. But, but really, from the standpoint of you guys, what do you do when you get out in the construction world? You get involved in a lot of this kind of stuff. And the more of this you get involved in, probably the better, <coughs> better, uh, yeah, better managers you are, or the better, or the, or the, the more you're involved in that, the probably the most, the more beneficial you are to us as a company. If you're chasing that end of the business, that's usually positive from the standpoint of cash and cost and all that. If you're out there fixing stuff and not late making the manufacturers aware of their problems, it's costing us money. So we really look for maintenance guys to be doing a lot of this stuff here. Chasing machine problems, managing warranty, doing very little maintenance work, or excuse me, repair work, and doing a lot of maintenance work. And when we start talking about maintenance work, we're talking about not doing repair work, not doing all the things that you learned about this school. Now, there's all kinds of things, you know, we can talk about from this point on, but basically in the company, we've got a huge maintenance program. Uh, it's got all kinds of parts and pieces in it. We could spend literally the next five days in this room covering each little piece of it, talking about our philosophies on maintenance or other contractors' philosophies. They're all about the same for the most part. But uh, get right down to it, there's a lot of different things that are involved in a maintenance program, all the way from selecting people to managing shops to equipment tooling, visual inspection, oil analysis, loop, on and down. You know, we got fuel conservation, all different kinds of things in maintenance. But for the most part, you know, what we want to talk to you about this afternoon is basically what really needs to happen in the, in the, the, the business. And again, it, it's, it's a lot different than a repair operation. It's a maintenance operation. This happens to be a picture right now of a job on Mount St. Helens. And uh, remember Mount St. Helens? Yes. It's a mountain that blew up. And, <clears throat> What we're doing is we're building a road that goes back up in there so people can drive up there and look at it. It's really a different different place and it's uh, the guys that are on that project, they work a lot of long hours. Isn't that still active? Yeah, it's still moving around and every once in a while it farts and lets out some smoke, you know, and, and something happens and it isn't, it, you know, naturally it isn't going to be uh, like it was the last time. The last time, you see this mountain, about this high, literally the whole top of it blew out. Phenomenal. See trees, trees this big around snapped off. Amazing stuff. But uh, a lot of the work we do is on, on projects like that, and, and the name of the game is just doing maintenance work and whatnot. Any questions on that? What we're talking about? Let's take another five-minute break. We need to change slides. All right, get you to. This blade is hung onto a, a circle 
that circle lets that blade turn, huh? In different angles so you can move the rock with the dirt different different directions. And I guess, you know, all this equipment, regardless of whether it's a motor grader or anything, requires maintenance and, and to us, the ways of doing maintenance on construction equipment is basically going out and looking at it is step one. Okay? Now, imagine that you guys were all out on a construction job and you were doing a lunchtime inspection, you were out looking at this thing and shut down for lunch hour, and you were to walk up to this machine and you were to stick your head underneath this machine and look forward towards the front axle. Okay? And when you looked up front there, give me some reflections on what you see. Now I realize you guys aren't trained in the fire arts of looking at motor graders, but uh, what do you see here? Looks like one of them keepers up there dropped down. One of these keepers right here is dropped down. Yeah. Explain that to him. That's a circle shoe and that's a retainer that holds that circle up into place. The circle pivots on it, it's a wear area. That's what that is. And what's happened here is there's a bolt broke out. These two here have come loose. Let that thing fall. Yeah, let it fall down. Now, what else do you see? Leaking cylinder on the front. Huh? A leaking cylinder on the front. The cylinder up here? Mm -hmm. Leaking, huh? How about this right over here? Can you make this out right here? Give that up close. Pin rotate. There's a pin and somebody's welded a clip over that thing. Why did they do that? So it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't come out. It wouldn't come, it come out, you're right. Why do you think it wanted to come out? For him, it wore out. Why is it wore out? That's right, it's wore out. That's where the front end pivot See, the front end pivot's off that thing. Why Why would one of them wore out? It was too greasy. Exactly. And nobody greased it, <laughs> and the thing basically started wearing out, and the pin started working out. And some. Somebody come along here, some dirt bag come along and weld a clip on it. Okay? Is that maintenance? No. That's, what do you call that? It's cobbling in it. Southern engineering. Southern engineering? Yeah. Southern engineering? You know, you look, whoa, 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 you look back here. You know, uh, you look back here at this uh, picture here, and a question I got from you guys is, is uh, this. Should you run this machine the rest of the afternoon? Remember I said we were out on lunch hour? Or should you stop it and fix it? Probably oh, should stop it. That big thing right there, that one more boat broke. They're going to put that in the line and break a whole lot of money for it, sir. I was just trying to probably fix that, 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 that pivot deal because that other stuff, it looks like it's been there for a while. Fix it that evening. That's good. You're, you're saying, hey, that, that oil leak, that's, been there that's no big deal. It's been leaking for a while. I can fix that later. This clip over here, somebody done fix that permanent, huh? It's been there for a while. <coughs> but you're saying this up here, you ought to. Yeah. You got to get on that. That could get you to get by right there. Let's, let's talk about that. You know, we're, earlier today we were talking about availability. Yeah. Okay. Didn't know that. What, what happens, you know, you guys are maintenance guys on a job and you just made the decision to shut that all down. What do you think about the guys trying to move that dirt on that job? What are they going to say if you want to shut that down? They're going to start saying, hey, you can't do that, right? Big time. I mean, majorly. I mean, they're going to be all over your ass. You know, all you can do is change parts to this run a goddamn machine, huh? Oh, they did probably say something along the lines worse than that. Sure. Got the three of them all on. Sure, they're going to say, I've run them without, they're going to lie, they're going to do whatever. All they can think about is moving dirt, right? They're dialed in. They're on your ass big. Now, around. honestly, deep down, how many guys in this room want to run that machine? Because that guy's on them, and how many guys want to fix it? How many guys want to run that machine? Is this thing going to fall off right now? There's two bolts left there. Good chance of it. I wouldn't worry too much about it falling off. You can get off. some of them back. <coughs> too. 
But that thing's getting fine instead of breaking that little bit, it might break 15,000 oh, off of stuff. It might break that old turn I trust that. I've asked him to get a couple bucks. He ain't got time to do that. 12.25, the operators are walking back over to the machine. you got to make up your mind right now. Are you going to run it and fix it after ship, or are you going to run it right now? Park it. Fix it. If it's on my back, I'm going to fix it. If it's on my back, I'm going to fix it. How many guys, guys want to run? Who's going to be responsible if it breaks? You are. The maintenance guy is responsible no matter what one goes wrong. Whether you fix it right, wrong, or you don't fix it, or you do fix it. You're responsible. How many guys are going to let her run? Nobody, huh? How long has it been like that? I don't know. It would be long we're running and put a bolt in it. Could there be? Maybe tighten it two bolts up with a bolt in it. Every day at lunch or something. Should. Ought to be fixed because it wasn't like that yesterday. It better get fixed. It should be checked every day. I don't know. It might not have been. We found it. You kind of got to wonder about that, don't you? If you know you checked that yesterday and it wasn't like that yesterday, it probably ain't going to last much longer. If you look up in there and there's a chunk of bolt sticking in there, it's got a clean break on it with no rust. You know that that happened real soon and it's getting bad in a hurry. Sure. You kind of gauge all that stuff, don't you? Kind of look at it, wonder what's going on, kind of figure that all, cipher it all out in your mind, huh? Anybody in here want to run it? Oh, you're right, you, know, you, sh you should fix it. And it gets as simple as what you're talking about. All you really got to do is shut the machine down for 30 minutes, push the thing back up into place. If there's a broken off bolt, get it out of there. If there ain't, screw another one in it and the machine continues to run, right? And under that basis, you're, you're totally right. You should fix it. What's the, what's the options if you don't fix it, John? What happens? And if you don't fix it, what happens is the, the turntable will come back into the, to the circle drive pinion right here. Snap that circle drive pinion off, and you're really down. Totally. Yeah, what you're saying there is, is this shoe is out of place. The circle can move, but it can snap off the circle drive. That machine won't run at all. I mean, you don't have an option, do you? Under this case, you do. And, and to put that into perspective, you know, here's a, a cost of fixing this machine. All you fellows in this room decided that you wanted to shut the machine down for a half an hour and fix it. Under that scenario, it would cost you basically $15 worth of labor, $6 worth of parts, nuts, bolts, whatever, 21 bucks. The result of all that was is that you had the machine down for half an hour. If you were going to go ahead and say, hey, I'll run it and chance it, and the machine failed, and what happened to it, the failure was like John described, it would take you five man hours to fix that thing, $150 worth of labor, $457 worth of parts, and $607. You compare 607 to 21, what's the cheaper way to go? Pretty simple, isn't it? But the big factor is, is the downtime. Look here, I only had a half an hour's worth of downtime by maintaining it, fixing it before it failed. And over here, depending on availability of parts, it'd be 4 to 12 hours to get the machine back up so it's running again. Pretty simple, huh? So many times in the construction business, you, you become overpowered and encumbered by the decision of, of maintenance people, or I should say operations people, telling you, hey, I can't shut it down. But I'll be real honest with you, if you have the ability to explain things to them and show them this, typically they're prudent enough to shut it down. They'll shut it down if they know that ultimately it might cost them 12 hours of downtime might cost them $600. And again, remember, the cost of moving dirt, part of it is the cost of maintenance, isn't it? If you can lower your cost by that much, by shutting the thing down and fixing it right, what's a good businessman going to do? He's going to fix it correctly, isn't he? Once you get out there on the job site, and your maintenance man finds the same, he tells operators, we need to shut it down. He says, no, we can't. Do you have to, does the maintenance man go find his supervisor, his manager, to go over and tell that guy to pay shut it down? How's it work? Who's going to have the last time? Who's got the authority? Who's got the authority on that? Well, that's exactly what you got to do. You got to go find.
mind you hear Schiff, former new master mechanic, telling you. And I would hang it in my star tag and say, hey guys, when the boss gets here, call him on the radio. We have radios in all our trucks, and he'd be there in a few minutes. So the mechanics got the authority to put a new in a star tag over there. Sometimes the operation people won't pay attention to that, but so you get a foreman there, and uh, he, can, he can get in there. So if they start the right? Pardon? Uh, if, you, if you put that big on operating tag on there, the only one guy jumps on the takes off and hurts somebody. Yeah, our guys won't pull a do not start tag off. If they're standing there and you're arguing with them and you hang one on it and they know that that's all wrong with it, they may give you a fit. If you had a do not start tag on a machine and you weren't there, there's not a soul in our company will touch it. Really, it's something that needs to be talked about. And it's not a it's not a situation where you've got your butt and heads. It's just that both sides want to, the maintenance guys want to do it right. The guys moving dirt, they want to they want to move dirt. I mean, let's face it, they don't want no maintenance guy shutting them down because he wants to screw around and do a bunch of chicken shit stuff. He wants to move dirt, huh? Yeah. Some guys look at that and say, well, that's chicken shit. One bowl fell out and you want to shut the machine down? Start talking about the difference in cost. And the, bigger, the biggest excuse is guys don't want to continue to run it for three hours. They just want to run it for another 15 minutes, just another 15 minutes. And invariably, that 15 minutes is what gets you. Yeah. Or another 30 minutes. We had a situation at the Denver Airport last year with a fellow you know, Marty Beck. And a 16 motor grader, machine similar to this, sitting down in a cut right in the middle where all these trucks were dumping dirt. And it didn't have any oil on the dipstick. And one of the maintenance guys says, Leave it there and we'll get some oil in it before you move. He says, I can't leave it here. You're shutting down the whole job. And it was. Literally shutting down the whole job. He says, I've got to move it. He says, I don't care what it costs. i got to move it from here over to there. Take me five minutes. Run this long and run another five minutes. Then run another minute. Scattered, man. Blocked the whole works. We're talking 100 Gs. Whose fault was that? It's that guy that said move it. He was wrong. In this case, although he did, he almost lost his job. I know a lot of guys who have lost their job for that shit. Okay? Another situation, job site situation. It's a Cat D10 tractor. Again, we're talking about essentially a 500 horsepower machine, something like that, 550, something. Uh, ripper on the back of it. All you're familiar with tracks on the machine, undercarriage. Putting yourself in a job situation, out looking at the job on a lunchtime inspection, such a matter. This machine right here, if you shut it down, the entire job stops. There's no getting by. You're out looking at it during lunchtime. You stick your head down here underneath the machine. You're looking for things like oil leaks, you're looking for things like loose parts, you're looking for pans ripped off the bottom, you're looking for problems with the rollers, tracks, you're, you're just doing a general once over inspection on that thing. When you look at this one right here, this roller right here, what do you see wrong? Okay. On the bottom part of the ship. There's a cap missing right here, huh? That's good. Okay. The question is, is what? In this case right here, guys, you're going to run this thing and risk tearing this roller out and trashing out the bottom of the undercarriage possibly and loose room of this bogey assembly. Or if you shut it down, you're going to shut the job down. There's about 40 people tied to this machine. Well, that's something that's just, just yeah. dangling by a thread anyway. It's, bad. it's not. Maybe it's going to screw up. It's going to screw up in a hurry. So you want to get another cap on it? Yeah. That would be. Everybody wants to get another cap on it? Okay. Yeah. 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 A cap might be 75 miles away. Oh, that's. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> as long as the weight stays on that thing, probably it's not going to fall out of it. If you get a rock bouncing it around, it's going to fall out of it. And what this thing's doing is feeding a crusher. 
and all the related people to it. This is in Newell, California. Rocky. Operating on smooth ground, so to speak. Rock. Shot rock. You call it ready with your boss. How about this one? 75 miles away. So what are you going to do? Are you going to shut the thing down? <coughs> or are you going to run it? Or what are you going to do? Might not run it until I go after one. What did you say? I said the fabricated cap. Spot welder. Fabricated cap. Could you spot welder that cap? I used to get by the car. That's exactly what I did. I'd, I'd, I'd get right up in there and make sure the roller was down in the saddle, spot weld it to it, and hold it until you got something to do. I wouldn't have spot weld it. I'd weld it good. Well, yeah. <laughs> you stick it on there with that hard rod. That's huh? right. Yeah. You weld it on there? You bet. Now, isn't that crazy? The bearings are here. Well, we're in that, we're in that house anyway, because it's running that. It won't run this assembly. This is a massive assembly, okay? Probably won't run that shaft. That shaft is a press assembly in that roller. Yeah. You're going to run that shaft. Is this, still be That's much cheaper to shut the whole job down for a period of time. It's not under yeah. warranty, it's a, it's a wear part, per se. Mm -hmm. huh? And it's something that if, it, it'll, if, it would, if that thing would have broken half and fell out, you might get warranty on it. But in this case, the bolts came loose because somebody didn't maintain them and they got loose and fell out. So it's, there's no warranty protection. Then the whole sickness go back and fix it right on the off ship. Yeah, so you can shut it down. And you get down to looking at that whole scenario on dollars again. Here we're talking about if you have the parts to do it right, it costs you like $84. If you didn't and you let it run and you had a failure the way it was, it cost you like $1,600. Okay? In the case of Finding that thing and welding it like John's talking about, one hour of downtime versus 16 hours of possible downtime, huh? How much stuff in school have you learned about doing like this? There's very little that you've learned here that prepares you for these situations. Yes, sir. Well, it would be hard to ever find an instructor and say you love that. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, when you got some big, burly, thick fingered, 18 inch neck, 12 cents, <laughs> size 6 hat, pinhead dirt dropper, leaning down your neck, saying, You ain't going to shut that phone with you, know? What are you going to do? <laughs> Start the huh? up. <laughs> you ain't going to be sitting in here talking like. <laughs> You ain't going to be sitting there saying, well, on page 45 of our fundamental procedure <laughs> at OSU, under paragraph 3, section 4, four sentence 2, it says you can't weld on jack. Well, I'm just saying you're able to find the to take the other. Not here. The business of equipment is availability. Very interesting deal, you know. You're going to compromise. You're going to do things that aren't like that. Here's another situation. This is a well. This is a uh, air compressor. It's on a different piece of machinery. It's a little Leroy 185. We've got about uh, a 900 of these things. We've got quite a few of them around. Uh, this one happens to be on a job in Southern California. Uh, let's, let's say you open up that hood and you look in there at the engine. You see that engine right there. What do you see with that engine? All the first thing. See an oil leak, huh? See an oil leak. Well, might be a fuel. I thought that was a fuel line. This is a oil sanding unit right here, huh? Okay. A little leak there. Yeah. You know, the story here is, is if you fix that thing right, uh, to fix that, focus that a little bit there, Poncho. There you go. To fix this thing right, it's 33 bucks. If you run that thing out of oil, it's forty-five hundred bucks, and we all know the answer, don't we? Huh? You start looking at that. <coughs> what do you really do when you go up 
and you find a machine like that. Yeah, you measure how much is leaking. I mean, you don't you don't sit there and say, hey, I've got to shut it down. I've got to fix this thing right because it says back in school, like you're saying, that you never run a machine without oil leak. You measure what's going on. And you determine if you can run it to the end of the shift. You know there's a little $3 seal there that needs to be fixed. And if it can be run to the end of the shift, you run it. And if that requires you putting oil in it every hour, you might do that. Or if it's running out real fast, you will shut it down, won't you? But if it's just dripping, you might fix it two days later, too, huh? Put a bucket. Who knows? GM provides, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but the thing is about this is, is what? How, how did we become aware of all these problems? By going out and looking at it. Going out and looking at it. If you're sitting on your butt in your mechanics truck or in working on a machine or you're busy working on a machine that's broke down because you didn't take care of something, so you got to repair it, how much of this do you think you're doing? That's kind of the fallacy of, of the repair business. Everybody likes to do repair work. It's neat to get into gears and shit and all that, huh? Figure out how all this stuff works. But you really get down to it. That's, that's not, again, we're not interested in you doing that. What you got to be doing is looking for these kind of oil leaks. What's the first thing you're going to do when you walk up that thing? Check that oil. You're going to check the oil. Right? You know what to do. And you're going to measure it. You're going to go on. How about if we're looking at a machine like, uh, and again, I'm back to, you know, one of the things you'll find out about equipment maintenance, whether it's construction or anything, half the business is managing oil leaks. Believe me, oil leaks are a big time ticket in the equipment business. So many machines today are hydraulic powered or, or whatever, got a lot of oil on them, a lot of seals. That's a big part of the business. How about this excavator here? Taking a quick look at it. It looks like a little tweak. <laughs> looks like it's tweak? It's like it's bent. Looks like it lost the The boom has come out of the machine, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay, now let me ask you a question. How many of you guys in here going to run that machine that way? Run <laughs> it. <laughs> the decision's been made for you, hasn't it? Yeah. Is there any decision to be made? No. no. Yeah, this is this is a very interesting story, but you know when this thing failed, you know as you can see the decision's been made. You can't make that kind of decision. We go out and we see the machines tore up. You know, in this machine, it's got a boom that's held in place by a boom foot pin. That boom foot pin has got a retaining bolt that holds the the, uh, the pin in place to the pin bosses and the frame bosses on the on the machine. When that thing failed, we went out. And we started looking at it, what do you think we found? The retaining bolt on the pin broke, and when it fell out, what happened? The big pin worked out. The big pin worked out, and when that works out, then the boom comes undone, doesn't it? Huh? And, and they talked about what this cost, and you know, we, we look at showing you all these examples here of what it costs and so forth. In the case of this deal right here, had we have caught that failure, we could have fixed it with a half an hour of manpower time. Probably done it on an off shift basis, cost us no downtime. It would have cost us 30 bucks worth of uh, $30. In the case of this scenario, it was 78 hours of, of manpower, 120 hours of downtime, and 20,000 bucks. Now what you don't see is, is that this is, a, this is a job on an island in the Kenai Islands. Where's that at? Start it's on an island called King Salmon in the Alaskan, uh, basically the Aleutian or the Kenai Islands. Now, this machine right here controlled the entire job. The, the job was basically excavating material and building an ice bridge across the river in the wintertime. So you could go out on a this island and get material and bring it back. You only had so many people there to work so many months. When this machine went down, everybody stood around. 
the cost of this whole repair with the downtime and the cost of the crew standing around was about three hundred ninety thousand dollars. Over one bolt, huh? One bolt. But they didn't have another machine that were close. Freight, getting a machine out to an island like that, expensive. Yeah. What's a more approved answer? How come we didn't have somebody looking at the machine? Right. You know, you think something like that bolt and that pin work out instantaneously? We put grease that thing. We got a greaser right here in the end of it. Because somebody was talking about their father being a service oiler. Where would you go? Did we lose it? Oh what? Somebody was talking about their dad working on the Alaska pipeline. That was we lost him, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he took off on us. Anyhow, uh, you know, an oiler. What's an oiler do? Maybe you have guys that drive around grease equipment. Yeah. Wonder where he was at all this time. Huh? Oh, Makes you wonder what kind of maintenance board. program they had going on. Again, I guess you know this is a hell of a, a deal, and, and what we're trying to do is show you guys some of the things that happens on jobs. Some of the situations that you get into, it's a lot different. So many of the failures that we're talking about can be prevented. And the way they're prevented is by going out and physically looking at the machinery. It's a timing deal. You look at something on a daily basis or a periodic basis to check what kind of shape it's in and you look at the key points on the machine to see what kind of problems you have with the machine. And on a daily basis what you want to do is fix the things you see that are wrong to keep it running one more day. And that's how you manage the maintenance on a daily basis on, on equipment. And again, it's a timing game. And, you know, there's all kinds of things we could talk about. We could talk about the effects of an out of adjustment clutch on a truck, you know, and what, what that costs you. You know, uh, everybody in here is familiar with how a truck works, pretty basic, you know. Uh, in, in a truck, you got a clutch, huh? Each day, a clutch has got to be checked. Uh, when you check the clutch on a truck, you're looking for an inch and a quarter of free travel and one inch of clutch brake. What's that mean? For what? For the this transmission. Engages with the throttle bearing, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if there's only a quarter of an inch? You're going to slip the clutch. You're going to be running it up against the throttle bearing, huh? Burn it out? How about, what, what's clutch brake do? Stops the gears in the gear. Yeah, it stops the gears in the transmission from spinning when you push down on the pedal. Remember, there's that little spot in the pedal there when you get it down, you get it just right and everything. It stops spinning so you can shift. Mm -hmm. If you haven't got clutch brake, what happens? Clutch gears. You grind gears and you rake them, don't you? Going from first to second to third or whatever. And you know, that's, that's how a clutch, that's what a clutch does. It takes the machine in and out of, divides the power, and basically lets you shift without making a mechanical uh, deficiency in the transmission. So I guess what we're seeing is, is you know, that's how you adjust the clutch. The facts are, is one of them isn't running right, isn't adjusted right. A clutch in a construction truck typically will fail in eight hours if it isn't adjusted correctly, or at least it will shorten the life by 50%. And if the transmission or the clutch doesn't have proper clutch brake, typically the transmission will fail in a construction application for 40 hours operation. A lot different than running down the highway. You're not using the clutch that much. In construction, you're more dependent on a clutch. You really are. You're doing a lot of shipping, pulling grades, doing work, backing in and out. Running down the highway, it's a little bit different. really don't even need a clutch on a lot of trucks running up down the highway, do you? Construction, you pretty well need one. You know, where it's at is, is to adjust the clutch, it's about $25. No downtime. You can go out there and check each day and, and you do it right. If you run a transmission or a clutch out of adjustment and you fail it, it'll cost you like 550 bucks. Cost you one to two hours of downtime. You lose it throughout bearing. If the transmission fails because you don't have any clutch brake, it's gonna cost you something like $1,500, three to four shifts of downtime, but typically 
like we get involved in so many times, we lose them both at the same time. And here we are, we're talking about a week of downtime, $2,700 versus $25 or $30 a month. And, and there you can see really the value of looking at this stuff every day, can't you? You check it every day, you can catch it before it goes out of adjustment. If you're not checking it every day, so it's going to cost you. Today, so much of this in this area is important because the federal government requires you to do it. You've heard of things like CDLs and all those things. It's a big deal anymore, huh? Required by law. Now, all these examples we've been talking to you about for the last 45 minutes are repairs of, or, or examples of maintenance work or repair work. And like we said about an hour and a half ago, we're not here today <coughs> representing the construction industry telling you fellows here at this school that we're looking to hire guys and get people to do repair work. We absolutely are not interested in people who do repair work. We're really interested in people who can do maintenance work. Believe it. I mean, there's going to be people who have to do it, but for the most part, we're looking for maintenance people. We really are. And, you know, it's a very difficult thing for people to understand. But, but that's where it's at. We want people who can maintain equipment and fix things and identify problems with them before they fail. We're not, we're not interested in guys that can fix things after they fail, change parts and do things like that. We want people to keep availability up, keep down running so we can make money, build highways. We assign uh, 